Wow, good morning. Uh, I think this is literally the largest number of people I've ever spoken to. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, very cool, very impressive. Thank you for uh, for for coming. Um, and to everyone over here, uh, I'm I'm super psyched to talk to you. Uh, you know, Paul asked me to come in and talk a little bit about uh, what we went through at Evernote, especially in the in the early uh, years, um, and uh, the the mistakes we made and the lessons we learned. And I'm I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, Evernote didn't come out of nothing. Uh, it it was our, our third. Uh, startup, and uh, we learned a lot, uh, kind of all the way through the process. Um, the first real startup that I was involved with, um, I started with a, uh, with a with a few college uh, roommates of mine, uh, you know, my best friends uh, in Boston. We called it Engine Five, and uh, and that was, I think, uh, kind of the first and, and and probably the most important lesson to me right there was was that I had uh, great co-founders. Uh, the, the most important thing, and, and, and this is very much the same team of people that was with me at the first startup, and then the second startup, and then, and then many of them are even at Evernote. Uh, and so I think the most important thing to do at, at, at as young an age as possible is to just cultivate this group of uh, really, really brilliant, high energy, uh, you know, willing to work for free, uh, best friends for, for life. Um, and and it's super important to do that, and, and you, you kind of have to pay attention. Like, I got lucky. I got lucky that, that the people that I, that I happened to meet in, in, in college in the computer science department uh, of Boston University are people that, that, that have stuck with me for, for at least so far the rest of our lives, and, and I fully expect uh, much longer. In fact, I would go so far as to say that you shouldn't even make friends with people that you don't see starting a company with. And it sounds dickish, I guess, but like you, to be honest with you, like why, why bother? Like you only have, you only have so many best friends that you're gonna have, and if you can't, if you can't imagine counting on them in a pinch as a co-founder, uh, you know, use those, yeah, use those resources uh, 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 wisely. And so I, I just lucked into it. I happened to get these great people, and, uh, and and I've been able to get really great people in in every other company. So basically, we started our first company, Engine Five. Um, the core group of those people went on to found the second company, Core Street. Uh, the core group of those people went on to found Evernote. Uh, Evernote, I really hope, is, the, is my life's work. I don't intend to really work on anything else. Um, but if I ever do, I already know, you know the, the, the 50 or so people at Evernote that, uh, you know, that are going to hopefully be with me uh, for whatever the next thing is. And so developing this crew is super huge. And uh, I can kind of tell from most of you, you look like you're right at about that age and an area of life where you're making these connections, you're making these friendships, and uh, it's going to go by really fast. Uh, so let's make the most of it. Uh, so Engine 5 was a, uh, uh, we were consultants. We started this company. There was originally going to be five of us, uh, but then two people chickened out, but we already had the domain name. Um, and it was just all three of us were, were computer programmers, we were all developers. Uh, and uh, we literally didn't know that there was such a thing as investors. Like, this was a new concept to us. We didn't know that there were people who would give you money uh, so that you can build something. We just assumed that uh, the way you build a business is, you know, you just start working and you get paid and you make more money than you spend and so on. And luckily this was right at the lead up to the original uh, dot-com bubble in the, in the very late 90s and so if you could program, people would just throw money at you. And we didn't have much motivation in starting this company other than we just wanted to work together. We wanted to see what it would be like to have a company, to be our own boss, to, you know, to call the rules. Um, and so we did a lot of you know, programming, consulting, uh, mostly around e-commerce stuff. And what we learned, and this is probably the second most important lesson, is um, uh, you know, being your own boss and having your own company and, 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 and making the rules kind of sucks. Um, if what you're doing ultimately is, you know, is being a consultant, it's just like you're just getting paid by somebody else to you know, write some code. Um, because you're not actually building any value, any long-term value. You can, you can be getting paid, you can be making a decent amount of money while you're working, but all of this idea that you're actually calling the shots and you're in control is, is a complete illusion if what you're really doing is working for, you know, building something for some other company. So it's amazingly hard work, uh, and the rewards are very immediate, but they're not, they're not lasting. You don't, you don't build anything up. Um, and so after working 
you know, harder than we've ever worked for, for about two and a half years. Uh, you know, 16 hour days uh, on average. Uh, I remember, you know, I would come into the office at like 2 a.m. and there would be people, you know, leaning out of the windows smoking because we didn't have time to even go outside. And back then people used to smoke, you know, ask your parents. Um, and, and we finally did sell that, uh, we sold that company uh, to, uh, to a big company called Vignette in, in Austin, Texas about two and a half years later and uh, we were super happy to sell it because we didn't, we didn't love this work. We were just working for somebody else. We were just building stores and e-commerce things and so we sold it. And it was pretty cool. Like, we didn't know how to sell a company so we came down to Austin and it was totally, the, the acquirers did everything that you would expect. Like they totally like slid the paper across the table with like I'm going to write down a figure and slid it across the table. And, <laughs> Uh, I'm totally serious, it was exactly like that. If any of you have seen the, uh, the Always Sunny in Philadelphia episode, it was, it was just that. Uh, <laughs> um, so we sold that company, uh, and uh, a couple years later, we, we, we left Vignette and we decided, okay, what do we learn? You know, let's do, time to do something new, time to start a company, because obviously we weren't gonna go and get real jobs at this point. But what lesson did we learn? And we said, well, our lesson is we don't wanna be consultants. We don't just wanna develop stuff for somebody else. We wanna build a product. And so we started our second company, which was an MIT spinoff um, at the time called Core Street, uh, where we got together with this brilliant uh, MIT uh, cryptographer um, to build uh, cryptography and security stuff for banks and for governments, you know, products. And, uh, and that was better um, in the sense that we were building a product, we were building something reusable, we were building something that we can add value to. But what we got wrong was it turned out that um, it wasn't a product that any of us were madly in love with. Uh, because it turns out nobody is madly in love with, you know, government security and cryptography stuff. Um, like, people don't wake up in the morning being like, oh, yeah, I'm so excited. The new government standard for contactless smart cards is out today. Uh, well, like, one guy does that. That, was, that guy was me, so it was, like, doubly sad. Um, and at, at, at some point, basically, we decided after about seven years of this, um, and, um, you know, we had a good experience. We, we, we set out to, to, to change the world a little bit, to redefine security. I think we did that in a small way. Um, but what we started realizing was like, man, we just like, I'd sooner chew my own arm off than like sit through one more, you know, Department of Defense procurement process uh, hearing. Um, and uh, so we, we, we exited that company. We brought on, you know, adult leadership and then we were able to sell that, that second company as well. Uh, and then got together in... 2007 and said, okay, now we're all, you know, in our, in our mid-30s and we've had two companies and we've had, uh, you know, some exits, we've made a little bit of money. What do we want to do now? What, what lesson did we learn? And we said, okay, well, the first lesson we were right, you know, let's not be consultants, let's build a product. But the second lesson is it shouldn't just be any product. It shouldn't be a product about, we shouldn't sit around thinking, you know, what does the market want? You know, what, what does the market fit? How do we build something that we can sell? What will people buy? We got really tired of that. I got tired of board members and investors constantly telling me, which would happen all the time, they would constantly tell me, you know, remember, Phil, you're not the target audience. You know, your customers are the target audience. And, you know, remember, the best product doesn't always win. Um, but all those, things are, all those things are true, and they're especially true if you're building stuff for, you know, systems for banks and for governments. But they were just boring. And we said, okay, the third time around, let's do this again but let's only build something for us. Let's build something that we love. Um, let's build something that we love that we, so that we are the target audience um, and, and, and let's do it in a way that uh, we're not gonna try to sell the company because we've sold two and you know, selling a company is, is uh, it, it's a mixed feeling. I mean, it's nice, especially the first time you do it if you have a decent exit and you make some money, um, but you are, you know, you, you put your entire life into this for years and then you know, and then it's not yours anymore. So it's, it's, it's at best a bittersweet feeling. And we said the third time around, let's do it differently. Let's, let's have two guiding principles. Let's only build things for us that we're in love with, that we want to use. And let's build a company that we want to keep. Uh, let's explicitly say there is no exit strategy. Let's make something that is sufficiently epic to be our life's work. Um, and if you have something that's your life's work, you don't need an exit strategy. There's no exit strategy for your life's work. You should have a liquidity strategy, especially if you're gonna raise money. You, shouldn't, you don't need an exit strategy. Let's make something sufficiently epic. Let's make something that we can devote our lives to, uh, that we can devote our lives to building, and let's build it for us. Um, and that was, that was the motivation uh, for Evernote. So we, uh, we sat around thinking, okay, well, what should we build? Uh, well, let's start with stuff that we like. You know, what do we like? 
uh, and uh, we said, I said, uh, you know, I play a lot of video games. So I love video games. Let's, you know, maybe we should start a video game company. Um, and we thought, okay, um, but we already have really great experiences with video games. You know, even back then, there was already like a giant stack of games that I wanted to play that I couldn't play through. I thought, like, the world isn't, like, the world isn't going to be significantly better if we add another one, because there's already people doing a great job keeping us entertained with video games. So then we thought, okay, well, what else do we like? And, and one of my co-founders said, well, you know, I kind of like the new um, social networking, social media stuff. And we thought, yeah, that is kind of cool. Uh, you know, Twitter was just kind of getting started. Uh, there was a few other things, but we thought, you know what, there's already so many companies doing it, and it's already a great experience. And, you know, I mean, MySpace has already done everything you'd ever do with a social network. Like, why, <laughs> why would we want to start something, you know, to compete with MySpace? Already providing a great, a great service. There could be nothing better. Uh, and so we, we decided not to do that. Uh, by the way, I suck as an angel investor, just, just, just so you guys know. Um, uh, but then we thought, okay, well, uh, we have pretty good experiences with entertainment, we have pretty good experiences with communication and with social networking, but when we're using productivity stuff, when we're using stuff to try to make us smarter, to try to actually accomplish something, it's for the most part just a really crappy experience. Uh, every time we use uh, you know, productivity software, it feels either old or, or kind of cultish. Um, it doesn't actually get the job done. It doesn't feel very elegant. And we thought, okay, that's cool. Like, we're all nerds. We all want to build a second brain. We all want to be smarter. It isn't a good experience right now. It really feels like things like smartphones and app stores are about to take off uh, and get started. Let's, let's build something that is, that is going to be the, the modern definition of what it means to be effective and productive uh, as a knowledge worker. Um, and, and we set out to do that. Um, so we... we, we uh, made a plan. We were going to call the company Ribbon, uh, like you tie a ribbon around your finger to remember. And then in, in my due diligence, in my research about it, uh, we were in Boston. We ran into this other group of people here, in, in actually very close to here, in Cupertino, um, sorry, in Sunnyvale, uh, that was called Evernote. That was started by this guy named Stepan Pachikov, and he had a team of people. Uh, Stepan is sort of this, this uh, genius, kind of mad scientist, inventor, entrepreneur, kind of Russian-American guy. He had a team of people that actually worked, that went all the way back to the Apple Newton days. Um, the Apple Newton was kind of the way ahead of its time, you know, first kind of portable device with handwriting recognition and everything. And they were working on this idea of a second memory to everyone, uh, you know, building a, a second brain. We were talk, saying the same things. So Stepan and I got together and we decided, hey, instead of, you know, instead of competing, let's, let's actually just merge the companies. Let's merge the teams uh, and, and make something Evernote. And so we merged the two teams in, um, in 07, and we kind of recreated the company, relaunched it uh, as a new company called Evernote. We recapitalized it, which means uh, it's a technical financial term. It means that it used to have a capital N, Evernote, and we, we made it a lowercase n. Um, we also changed the investment structure, but that was less important to me. Um, and we launched a new product in 2008. And, uh, and there was an important lesson there, too, which is uh, this was a mistake that I think we made. Um, it was a very unconventional start. This wasn't the typical start, Silicon Valley startup start where, you know, you go to Y Combinator and you have, you know, a couple of co-founders and you get an A round and you start something. We didn't do that. Uh, it was a weird, complicated structure with kind of two teams coming together and one of them already had some investments and it all had to get redone. And this was a big mistake. I mean, it was great that we combined the teams and that we merged and the personalities were great and, you know, we were able to build something really fantastic. But we were way too clever with the structure. And I'll never repeat that mistake. It does not pay to be clever, to be innovative on, on kind of the structure, on the legal entity and how you divvy up your stock and any of that kind of stuff. Because it basically made us unfundable for a couple of years. Because until we were significant enough that it was actually worth, you know, a VC's time actually understanding, like, why we were different and, and figuring out how to unwind it and how to fix it, until we were significant enough to get over that barrier, like, no one would even, no one would even take a look at us. Um, and uh, it took us, you know, the fact that we were clever in the, in the, in the early days and tried to kind of preserve this, this un unconventional structure probably cost us 18 months of, of not being able to raise money. Um, so I definitely don't advise that. I don't advise doing anything particularly clever or different about how you, how you do the basics and the dynamics. So just pay attention to what people here will tell you and at YC and, and other resources and just do exactly that. Be innovative about one thing only which is your idea. Like, that's the only thing you can afford as startup founders to really be innovative about is the main thing that you're doing, 
everything else you want to do as by the book as possible, at least in the early days, uh, to, to minimize your chances of failing for a stupid reason. And we almost did. Evernote almost failed for the stupid reason that we were too clever with our legal forms early on. So, um, you know, we cleaned up uh, everything. And, uh, you know, we had, we had, we had self-funded it. I put some money in, Stefan put money in. We had some friends and family investors. Uh, but we were just about ready to raise a big round. And um, it took a long time. Uh, but we finally got a $10 million term sheet. Uh, not from a Silicon Valley investor, from a, a European investor. The Silicon Valley guy still, like, still didn't want to talk to us. Um, and uh, we had about three weeks of cash in the bank left. It was a very long due diligence because we had to fix all the structure stuff. But the deal was supposed to close finally, and it was supposed to close in, uh, in 2008, in the, in, the, in the fall. And the day it was, the closing date was actually the day that uh, Lehman Brothers um, collapsed. Uh, and, uh, and the investor called me on the day of closing and said, um, hey, we just lost 60% of our fund value in one day. Uh, we're not going to do the investment. Um, and I had, uh, we had three weeks of cash left at that point. Uh, we hadn't we hadn't been able to talk to too many other investors for about the previous three months because we were kind of locked up in due diligence, you know, with exclusivity, and uh, you know, so we panicked. Uh, at that point, I already had twenty something people uh, in the company, uh, so I spent a week just frantically calling everyone, calling everyone I knew, everyone I didn't know, just trying to get you know, trying to get meetings, trying to get investment. Nothing, absolutely nothing. It was arguably the worst time to be doing it in the history of the of the universe. It was you know, like late October, two thousand eight. Uh, I wasn't particularly good at it. We had a spectacularly bad uh, VC pitch. A VC pitch went something like this. I'll give it to you the quick version. I would say, uh, uh, hi, um, I'm Phil uh, Libin. Uh, you've never heard of me. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to make this thing called Evernote. It's going to let you, you know, um, write stuff down, remember things, uh, using you know, like computers and. Um, we're going to give it away for free. Uh, please give me $10 million. <laughs> and uh, uh, it worked in Europe. It did. It worked in Europe. Uh, <laughs> and then usually, you know, usually that would be enough to get us thrown out in Silicon Valley. But, but, but sometimes, just out of politeness, they would like ask a follow-up question. And the, the, the most common question would be like, so who's your competition? And oh man, I, I, would, I would nail this one. This one would be great. I would say, oh, our competition. Well, um, pretty much every single computer or phone or PDA or any other device that's ever come out in the last 50 years already has a pretty good free note-taking solution on it. <laughs> and that, that didn't help us either. Anyway, uh, that was, I, I digress. So, um, so we were out of cash. I spent a week uh, trying to get cash, nothing. Now we have two weeks of cash left in the bank. It was 3 a.m. and I totally remember this day. I was sitting there at 3 a.m. and I decided finally this is it. I'm going to shut down the company tomorrow morning. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to, I'm going to stand up from my desk. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to force myself to sleep. I'm going to come into the office tomorrow. I'm going to lay everyone off and shut down the company. Because we only had two weeks of cash left and you can't really take it to zero. Then you get into legal trouble. So you have to make sure you, know, you like pay the last bills and all that kind of stuff. And I decided this was going to happen. And I remember sitting there at 3 a.m. when I finally decided to do this, and, and I kind of had this epiphany. I kind of thought, oh, this is what it must feel like to be an adult. Um, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was an adult. This is what it feels like to be an adult, to make an adult decision. This sucks. <laughs> Whatever happens afterwards, I'm going to optimize my life for, for, for being as childish as possible from here on out. But I decided that this is what was going to happen. And uh, at about 3 a.m., right before I went to sleep, I got, I got an email. And so I said, all right, I'll read one more email. And uh, this email was from some random guy in Sweden. And he said, uh, dear Phil, I'm a random guy in Sweden. Um, and uh, I, I'm just writing to let you know that I love Evernote. I've been using it for about, about uh, two months. It's only been out for about two months at that point. I've been using it for about two months. And I love it. It's changed my life. It's made me happier, it's made me more organized, it's, it's, it's really great. And I remember thinking, oh, that's nice. That makes me feel better. You know how they say, like, if you can make a difference to one random guy in Sweden, you know, you've kind of achieved something. <laughs> um, but then, then he went on to say in his email, uh, so I'm just writing to see if you guys need any investment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I wrote back, and I wrote, 
why, yes. <laughs> we would like some investment. Uh, and then I stayed up, I didn't go to sleep. And 20 minutes later, I was in a Skype call with him. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, we told him the, the whole situation. And two weeks after that, he, he wired us half a million dollars. Um, and it was exactly enough, that half a million dollars was exactly enough that, you know, we cut back, you know, I, I had stopped drawing a salary a while ago and some of the management staff wasn't drawing a salary and we really cut, you know, we really, you know, tightened our belt. But that half a million dollars was enough. It, it got us, it lasted about, you know, six months and then the worst of the crisis was over. But more importantly, we had already cleaned up all of our structure and the most important thing is we finally had traction. We finally had enough data where I could do a VC presentation that wasn't awful where I can actually say, this is the model. You know, these are the cohort charts. These are the unit, unit economics. Here's how the business is actually working. Here's how we are making money today, and here's why it's going to scale. Uh, and that six months made all the difference. Uh, and then we were able to, to, uh, to get financing. Still not from Silicon Valley people. Uh, the first investors were actually Russians and uh, Canadians and, and Japanese. Uh, we got one of our first investors, professional investors, was Docomo Capital, you know, the giant telecom in Japan. Um, the reason we got that uh, was pretty good. You know, they, they, they reached out somehow on Twitter because, you know, they liked Evernote. Uh, by the way, every single investor in Evernote from the early days down to the people that we, that we're bringing in, you know, now, last year, every single investor is a fan of the product. We don't, like, we don't even talk to people anymore who, who don't love Evernote. But, but even early on, when no one knew what it was, the investors were all giant fans of the product. So we build it for us, but... It turns out we also build it for our investors and for our employees and, and for the media and for every, every other constituency that was important to us. Uh, so Docomo came in. Uh, you know, we were still struggling at that point. We still didn't have too much professional investment, but uh, a, couple of, a couple of executives flew in uh, from Japan, uh, and they had a meeting with uh, myself and uh, our CTO, Dave Engberg, uh, one of my co-founders, and uh, in our office in Sunnyvale, and you know, they come in to, to the room, and you know, we bow and, and, and say hello, and then in back of me, I, see, I hear Dave you know, talking to them, and I hear Dave uh, say thank you very much to them in Korean. Uh, and, and, and I hear this, and um, my thought is like, well, you know, why is Dave speaking to these people in Korean? And I kind of look at him, and he immediately realized what, what he had done, because he was just in Korea, and he was just, you know, his brain just got frazzled. So he immediately realized what he had just done, that he just spoke, you know, he just said thank you. He meant to say hello in Japanese, but he instead said thank you in Korean. Uh, and he's like, he's totally pale. Like, he's just ashen. Like, he is so embarrassed. And I look at the Docomo guys, and the Docomo guys are completely, completely embarrassed. And, and the thing with, with, with Japanese people is they're so, like, for the most part, they're so emphatic, uh, uh, they have so much empathy. Like, they feel your embarrassment worse than you do. <laughs> and, 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 like, they're mortified about how bad we feel. Uh, and so the only way out of the situation was for them to just give us several million dollars just to, like... <laughs> um, just to prove uh, that, you know, there was no hard feelings. So, so we, we got lucky in that, in that as well. Uh, but then, you know, then things did get a lot better, and, uh, and then we did have traction, and then a lot of, and Morgan Thaler came in as the first uh, Silicon Valley firm, and then Sequoia went in big, you know, several times, and it got, you know, it got a lot harder. <laughs> um, it got a lot harder once we were a real company. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't appreciate that at the time, that actually the most fun I ever had, the most carefree <laughs> that I ever was, the least stress that I ever had, was back when it looked like we might go out of business any day. Uh, it was back when the only priority was to raise money. Because uh, things, were, things were really simple. Um, things were really simple, and um, uh, there was one fitness function. You know, as an engineer, I just appreciated this. I said the only job is to raise money to make sure that we can meet payroll and have enough, you know, have enough cash. And, and so you know when you're successful, right? When the check, when you, when you call the bank and you see that there's a few more million dollars in it, you're like, yes. Um, and you're totally ready to fail at that point. You know, you just, you, you, you expect to fail. You're ready to do it. You've made peace with it. You know what's going to happen. Uh, and, and in fact, it's kind of liberating. Um, and the day after we raised, I think, our B round, which was the first time where we had, you know, a couple of years of cash in the bank and we really felt like we weren't, we were no, we were out of immediate existential danger. Uh, you know, that day we, you know, we celebrated, we had a big party, it felt great, and like the next morning is when it got hard. The next morning is when I said, okay, like now there's an actual company, now there's people depending on us, now there's millions of users, now there's expectations, now is when we actually have to, 
uh, now is when we actually have to do something. Um, and um, so, it, so, you know, I can stand here and say, you know, traditionally, the, you know, it gets better. Uh, it does very much, uh, but it also gets harder. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily get easier. And so you shouldn't be in this business. You shouldn't be uh, thinking about founding a company if, if what you're trying to optimize for is easy. Um, it's never gotten easier for me. It gets harder and harder all the time. Uh, but it also becomes more and more important and more and more rewarding. And in some sense, more and more fun. Uh, you know, somebody asked me, a reporter asked me the other day if, if I was still having fun uh, day to day. And, and I have to be honest, I have to say, you know what, I'm not. It's not fun day to day. It's a huge amount of fun month to month, but it's not fun day to day. You know, when, when I look back, like what do we achieve in the past 30 days, it's awesome. It's really fun, it's really gratifying. But day in and day out, when you're like doing the job, difficult is, is, is kind of the main thing. Difficult, but since I still have this amazing team of people, this team of people who are much smarter than I am, who are much more capable than I am, many of which have been with me now for 20 years, but you know, many have only been there for a couple of months, um, it's, vastly satisfying. And the only reason this works, the only reason that, that I can see myself doing this, even though it's super difficult and super stressful, I can see myself doing this for the rest of my life, um, and, uh, and it stays rewarding, is because we found something sufficiently epic to do. We didn't try to think about what piece of crap can we sell someone to make some money and flip the company. We thought about what can we do that we will continue to stay in love with. And this is the main, this is the main way that starting a business right now is different from starting a business even five years ago. If you were starting a business even five years ago, it would have been stupid advice to say build it for yourself. If you're starting it now, it's stupid advice to do anything else. Uh, because if you build something for yourself, if you build something that you love, that you think is sufficiently epic, if you make something that you love, there's probably another billion people in the world that love it as well. And, okay, unless you're like a really weird, unless you're just like a... <laughs> Unless you're like a spectacular weirdo. But even if you are, even if you're like, even if you're several, you know, uh, standard deviations away from, uh, from the center of the bell curve on weirdness, there's probably still 10 million people that love something just as weird as you. And because the tech world, because of the way that the tech world has assembled itself, because of app stores and smartphones and social media, the tech world is more of a meritocracy than it's ever been. And so if you build something you love, those 10 million or billion other people will also love it They'll know about it the next day. They'll be able to find it. They'll be able to use it. They'll be able to pay you. And if you're making it for yourself, if you're making something great, you're at a huge advantage over somebody who's making something for somebody else because you can at least tell when it's great. You, you know. You're making it for yourself. You can be an honest critic and an honest judge of your own products. And if you're not doing that, it's, it's, just, it's just much harder. Um, so make something sufficiently epic. Make something that you will be able to be a fair judge of when it's achieved greatness, uh, or at least when it's close to it. I don't think we've achieved greatness at Evernote, but I think we get closer to it every day. Uh, and uh, don't bother making friends with people who uh, you can't start a company with. Thank you.